Hello and welcome to the RPG Academy podcast Twitch channel. My name is Michael and we are here tonight for Detention Live with special guest co-host Craig Campbell. Craig, say hello everyone. Hello to everyone. Excellent. So I literally just ran downstairs and then just ran back <laughs> up and I'm out of breath. Uh, as I was talking to Craig just before we started uh, that uh, my internet's kind of unreliable, but I've kind of figured out the secret is if I'm not uploading anything, it seems to be okay. Uh, problem is that when I do upload something, it takes like 15 hours, and that's not an exaggeration. So I was uploading my newest uh, video from when I play video games during the day, and I realized that it was still uploading because it's not been 15 hours yet. So I ran downstairs to pause that to get back up here, and so far, <laughs> things are green, so it looks like it was worth the effort. Uh, so we're going to jump into detention. If this is your first time with us, it's our sort of loosey-goosey talk show format here at the RPG Academy. Uh, we talk about RPGs in a couple different avenues. We do some improv games. I often say badly. At least I do them poorly. Craig may, may be the ringer here tonight. Uh, we talk about some monsters, maybe some ways you can use them in your home campaigns. And then we end with audience Q&A. So if we have anyone in the audience that wants to jump in and say hello, please do. So, Craig, first of all, for people who may not know you, give us the quick rundown on your bona fides in the RPG world. Um, uh, I'm Craig Campbell, um, and I'm the owner and lead designer at Nerdburger Games. Uh, I've done a bunch of freelancing over the years for um, D&D, a little for Pathfinder, um, uh, a handful of other games. And um, a few years back, I decided to uh, be a sucker and make my own game. Uh, which I did, and it's it funded on Kickstarter. That's Murders and Acquisitions, and since then I've published Die Laughing, um, and also uh, the award-winning Capers role-playing game, um, along with multiple supplements uh, and accessories and all that sort of thing. And uh, so that's that's kind of where the the bulk of my RPG ness falls right now is is uh, my little my little bitty game company where I make the games that like I wish existed um, and nobody else made, so I'll make them. Well, that's basically how that is supposed to work. Uh, and if anybody wants to go check those out, is it just nerdburger.com or is there a different place you'd send them to, to be able Nerdburgergames.com. to? Nerdburgergames.com. Nerdburger I think I have my um, chat set up where you can't drop links, but if you want to drop it without the .com, I'm sure people could figure it out. Um, it's a pretty easy website to find. Um, there's there and then there's it's there's stuff available. You know, everything's available at Drive Through RPG. Um, as well, um, although the uh, the website has, if you go to the store at nerdburgergames.com, that's where you can. That's the only place right now where you can get the the fancy deluxe hardcover of Capers that we did a a, a nice print run of um, a few months back. Uh, because I was going to be taking that book to conventions this year. Ah. Um. So that's not happening. So the only place you can get it right now is through the through the website. Uh, completely understandable. Uh, I just saw the alert pop up. Teleporta is now following, so thank you, Teleporta. Teleporta is actually often one of my co-hosts for the show, but it didn't quite work out today. But Craig and I will carry on solo, but thank you for joining, and I think you are said you were going to try to jump into chat a little bit. Uh, so the first official thing we do here in detention is what we call extracurricular, and this is where we talk about what we've been up to, what's going on in our lives, what's top of mind, what's most important. Craig, you are my guest, so would you please talk a little bit about what you got going on right now? Because I'm sure it's nothing important, right? <laughs> um, no, I don't have an ulterior motive for coming on detention at all. Uh, you know, I'm, and I'm, I'm, you know, game design is ongoing. There's things coming down the pike. Uh, but the big thing right now is on August 14th, 15th, 16th, uh, that Friday evening, and then all day Saturday, and then a big chunk of Sunday, um, I'm hosting Nerd Burger Con um, online, basically an online convention. Um, we've got a bunch of um, indie RPGs uh, lined up to be played, many of which are being run by the designers. I roped in a whole bunch of different uh, designers of um, some games you've heard of, some games maybe you haven't heard of. So it's um, a good opportunity to try out some uh, kind of out of the ordinary indie RPGs, um, maybe some things you've heard of and just never gotten a chance to play, maybe something you'll discover. 
um, and having never known existed. And uh, there's a couple of panels. We've got a few a few of those games are going to be streamed. Um, there's going to be some fundraising that happens during that um, in conjunction, just like all weekend long. During the streams, we'll be talking about it, and then it'll you know the, uh, the GMs will bring it up in the games as well. Um, fundraising uh, is going. Seventy percent of funds raised will go to the Trevor Project. Um, which helps LGBTQ youth in crisis. Uh, and 30% of the funds will go to um, my uh, Nerdburger Games contributing designer, uh, Shireen Gilchrist, who uh, just to help with some costs associated with some back surgery that uh, could very well change her life. Oh, um, some pretty significant. She's gotten some good news that there's uh, some some good things can happen. Um, but if, as as is always the case, money lies in the way. Um, so we want to help her out. Right, um, and there's a bunch of giveaways and yeah, there's going to be all sorts of stuff. It's like everything you would expect out of a con convention, except it's only going to be one or 200 people. And it's all going to be on the Nerdburger games discord, um, as far as organizing it. Um, and then, you know, people will, the GMs will use whatever platform is appropriate, the roll 20 or hangouts or discord or whatever to run right. their games. Now, as far as like people who want to jump in to play games, there's no, cost there's fundraising going on but there's no actual cost to buy tickets or play games or anything right correct the the the, the convention itself all the events and everything are free there's not there's no money required of you um if you wish to uh to give uh to uh charity and uh to help shireen you're welcome to do so by all means do but otherwise you can just and you can show up and and just play some stuff um the, the nice thing about a online convention is um like if, if, you, if you've got a local in-person convention you can like oh, i'll just go for a half a day or a day right but if you're going if you're traveling to a convention well now you're gonna you kind of commit yourself to the whole thing mm -hmm. but with an online convention you can literally just be like i'll pop in and i'll play this one game that i haven't had a chance to play so um and with with no uh you know cost associated with just getting in the door so to speak um you know, there's there's that there's that benefit of just it being like a big long game day weekend kind of thing. So pop in, play one game if that's all that you're looking to do. If that's all you've got time for. All right, and again, if they want to get more information about that, it's at also nerdburgergames.com. Yeah, if you go to nerdburgergames.com, there's a there's a page for the convention itself, um, and then that page has uh, a download link for the event uh, program. Uh, to let you see what's all available to to play and then if you it's also got a link to the discord and then within the discord is all the sign up stuff um, and there's instructions in there if you go to the there's a channel that is titled channel guide and uh part of what's in there is it is uh, instructions on how to use the bot that's floating <laughs> in a bunch of different channels basically there's a channel for each day and time slot where, where games might begin and in that channel is all of your events and there's it's 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 a neat little bot that all you got to do is just go in there and find the, the event that you want and you press the little plus one button and you get added to the list <laughs> oh nice yeah it's actually one of the things uh once this is kind of done for you because it's not far away is it literally next weekend or the weekend after yeah we can we can half from now as we're talking yeah uh because we're doing a catacon virtually this year as well just because we kind of have to it's funny i i made the decision and then within like three days i got an email from the dcc the our convention center who's like oh by the way we're closed for the rest of the year so sorry we're canceling <laughs> your event it's like well i kind of already made that decision but thanks uh so so i made it for it's, it's like when you clean your room before your mom tells you to you know it's like i did yeah. it for me <laughs> you didn't tell me to do it uh, so we're going to do virtual as well uh, it's going to be the same weekend as it always is so november or you know same weekend it was going to be anyways november 5th 6th or 6th 7th and 8th and uh, we are going to do a Kickstarter starting on September 1st. It's going to run for a month. Basically, it's $3, um, and that's just to help me cover some costs because I didn't know the world was going to end. Uh, <laughs> so I spent some money thinking we were going to have a catacomb this year. So I've got some, some money on my credit card. Not, not a terrible amount, but some. I uh, paid for some art for our custom T-shirt, for our poker chips design, all that kind of stuff like that. i got to make sure my artist gets paid because i've been making payments towards them but i still owe them some money and they're very sweet uh people and they have not yelled <laughs> at me but i would be yelling at me if i was them uh so we are going to do a little bit of fundraising but the big way that i'm hoping to raise enough money to cover all my expenses and then some is we're also pre-selling tickets for next year uh, so you can go ahead uh, and buy a, an actual badge for 2021 
uh, assuming that we are able to have the event there. If something happens and again, we have to roll it over, then those tickets will be good for 2022. Uh, but basically, if you want to get a VIP badge, this is probably the best way to do it because I don't think we're going to get a ton of people that are going to do that. Uh, but we are selling VIP badges. But, you know, regular badges, DM badges, the whole thing, you can pre-buy one for next year um, as well. as You can also get the T-shirt because we're still doing an exclusive T-shirt for this <laughs> year. You can buy it through this Kickstarter, but you won't get it until next year when we're <laughs> going to do an exclusive T-shirt for that year too. Uh, so if we show up to 2021, you can have two Kickstarter exclusive T-shirts. We're not going to order them until we get close. So, you know, I've lost – literally 99 and a half pounds in the last six months. So sizes can change. So if, <laughs> don't worry about ordering now and then, you know, being bigger or smaller, we're going to order them same time next year. And, and actually we might even get a bulk discount because we'll hopefully we'll be doing twice as many, but we'll see. Uh, and this, yes, I do so, want to mention. Oh, go ahead. So next year you can show up to a catacon on Friday with last year's t-shirt on, mm -hmm. get your this year's and next year's t-shirt and then boom, Saturday and Sunday, your, your, your upper body is covered. You're good to go. Absolutely covered. <laughs> uh, we're also going to, if we hit a certain level, which I think we will, we're going to go ahead and order because we were going to have D8s made because every catacon we make a special die this is our eighth year so we were going to make a d8 this year uh so we hit a certain level on the kickstarter we're going to go ahead and make those and you also will get them next year because those are always free everybody gets one that shows up uh but we'll actually make them and then there will be a special die for next year so you'll get up to two t-shirts you get two die we're going to have poker chips for both years all that kind of good stuff uh, so we're excited about that as well. And again, I don't want to mention New York Trader did actually send me a direct donation. We, I talked about this last time on Detention that we were trying to raise some money. And he just, out of the goodness of his heart, I'm not sure if he either has either of those, goodness or a heart. But somehow New York Tater sent me some money. And I really appreciate it. So thank you very much, sir. Uh, it looks like Ramey has also jumped into chat. Thank you for joining as well. He's one of our patrons and hangs out with us on Discord quite a lot. Hello. Uh, plays games with me on the regular. So hopefully if you've been listening, there's a chance for you to play some games next weekend after next with Craig and some of his friends through the uh, RPG world. Sounds very, very cool. All right. So anything else you want to talk about extracurricular? I'll, I'll, it just made sense to talk about a catacomb there too, but I kind of stepped on you. Um, no, that's okay. There's, uh, there's, uh, I'm not, not going to go into detail with it because I know that I'm going to be doing the rounds eventually. I tentative, uh, tentative Kickstarter date late September, like one of the last, uh, Tuesdays in September, it'll okay. be the 22nd or the 29th. Um, hopefully is, uh, I'm looking to kickstart, um, good strong hands, which is the next game, which is a fantasy game about fantastic creatures saving their fantastic world. Very cool. Okay. Well, uh, we can talk offline, but obviously we have some avenues that we can help you with that as well through our show and tell and trial programs. And uh, we will already check. talk to Tom. Oh, perfect. Tom, thank you. <laughs> Someone needs to, uh, but that would be fantastic. Uh, and as for me, I, I mentioned, I, I am literally down 99 and a half pounds. My, my, yeah. my goal is 110, uh, but, but a hundred still a really big milestone because I've lost a lot of weight multiple times. Uh, obviously the surgery played a big part of that. Uh, but I've never lost this much weight. And there's a good chance when I wake up tomorrow, I will have hit that 100-pound mark. And I'm pretty excited about that. It's a pretty big deal for me. We'll start doing some crunches right now. <laughs> get, <laughs> yeah. get the cardio going by the end of the show. Yeah, I did actually have to cut my uh, evening walk short a little bit because I mistimed a few things. Not Not anyone's fault but my own. But I usually walk twice a day, and I just wasn't able to uh, – to get that in. So, so I'm a little bit worried that maybe I didn't do enough today, but to get there, but we'll see, uh, hopefully anyways. And then, uh, I am still doing tons of podcasts. We recorded a review of forbidden lands. We're about to record a review for the new D and D mystic heroes of Theros or mythic. Sorry. Um, and then I also, uh, am running, uh, Phage, Fantasy Age, this Friday for some of our patrons and friends through our Discord. So I'm definitely keeping busy, uh, which is, you know, never a problem for me. But anyway, with all that out of the way, it's time for everyone's favorite part of the game, <laughs> our show, is when we do bad improv or improv badly. So the first improv game is uh, 10 things. So if you're unfamiliar, basically, we're going to give each other a prompt. And the idea is to come up with 10 things that fit that prompt as quickly as possible. Immediacy is more important than accuracy. So don't worry too much about making things that make sense for it. 
Uh, if you can, that's it's like bonus points. But the idea is to come up with 10 things as quickly as you can. So, Craig, you are my guest. Would you like to give a prompt first or receive a prompt first? Um, I will receive a prompt. All righty. So, I always like um, to try to tie our 10 things into what we've talked about for extracurricular. It doesn't always work. Um, but you said the name of the, the game that you're going to be kickstarting is Good Hands. Good Strong Hands. Good Strong Hands. So, Craig, give me 10 alternative or castaway titles for the name of this game if you had not chosen Good Strong Hands. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, <laughs> I hit on that title pretty quickly. Um, um, uh, uh, <laughs> Again, it doesn't have to make sense. Understood, understood, understood. Um, Oh geez. Um, well, here, let's 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 hit a few of these this way, just to give you. This will tell you what the inspiration for the for it is. Is uh, Willow? I don't own the IP. One. Um, the never-ending story. I don't own that either. <laughs> Two. Um, <laughs> the uh, the uh, getting out of the labyrinth. <laughs> Three. <laughs> um, because she, all she does is get in. She never gets back out. Um, Let's see. Uh, 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 the, the 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 slightly darkened crystal. Four. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, Tom Cruise before we knew him uh, from Top Gun, Five. which is to say the movie Legend. So those uh, <laughs> those are titles I couldn't use because they're all movie titles that I don't know the IP. Um, uh, what happened to all the gnomes? Um, we'll call it that one because I had gnomes in the game for a while, and I eventually decided to get rid of all of the D and D fantasy races. Um, at the same time, whatever happened? Uh, uh, what happened to all the orcs? Because I also got rid of some hey. of the monstrous races that have uh, uh, baggage associated with them. Yes, there's still a dragon to kill. Um, we'll call it that. Yes, there's still hey. a dragon to okay. kill. Um, because even though it is, it, it's a fantasy game that kind of delves into some different types of stories there's still going to be a dragon um and then uh big good strong hands because that's the full line that rockbiter uses in never ending story um but it's too long for the title just it seems like one word too long um that's nine Mm -hmm. one more um and craig finally does a fantasy game yay (laughs) things very good sir that that was a tough one because i kind of thought well you probably went through like a dozen you know names before you settled so i kind of Sorry, I thought it was a little easier than it was going to be, but you did a fantastic job. Well, there were there were quite a few, but to to be honest, I've forgotten what they are because it was like over a year ago. Um, and I had a friend I was attending a convention with last year who I, I suggested the idea of Good Strong Hands, and I wasn't sure about it because I was like, well, it's clear, you know, it's pulling a line from the never ending story. And so some people will get it, but other people won't. Yeah. And like, I was worried, like, well, for you know, it, if people don't get it, like the, the 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 title doesn't really tell you what the game is about. But then the more I thought about it, and he he said this too was like most games don't actually tell yeah. you what the game is. It, the the title doesn't tell you what the game is about. Dungeons and Dragons is an outlier. Oh yeah. In that respect, that it tells you what it's about. Pathfinder that doesn't tell you what that's about. No. Though, though like when I run D and I've, I've joked on this very many times. There's very rarely dungeons, and there's almost never dragons when I run the yeah. game. It's all <laughs> yeah, in a city politic role play game sort of thing. Uh, yeah, but uh, I actually I quote never in story all the time, which I'm sure we're close to the same age. You probably do as well. But the whole sure. there was nothing. A hole would be something. This was <laughs> like just anytime there's like a hole in like a game I'm role playing. Somebody mentions there's a hole. I just launch into that for no reason. But anyway, <laughs> all right. So my turn. So all what right. am I coming up with, Greg? Okay. Um, given that. Um, I mean, you've been doing a uh, running a cat, uh, you know, organizing a catacon for um, many years now. Yes. And uh, it, it is of it is of a certain size, mm-hmm. and it is of a certain complexity with a certain types of events and everything. If you had unlimited funds, um, and could have a four day con, and you could just jam everything you wanted in there, what are like the, the what are ten dream events or or things or themes or whatever that you know just a catacon normally couldn't accommodate easily that you could that you would put in there like stuff that you would see at gen con that you'd love to see at a cat okay um open buffet (laughs) never going to happen ever again uh those battle tech pods that you see oh yeah those are fun uh the masseuse chairs 
But you all... might be able to hire a masseuse to come out. But they'd be free if I had all them in the world because I would yeah, cover that, for that's everybody. That's true. That's true. Uh, I don't know. I'm your county. I don't need to count. Um, oh man, uh, a bingo game with giant d twenties. <laughs> um, uh, a movie theater, like a impromptu movie theater. Uh, okay. Hot yoga. Uh, ice cream socials. A uh, VIP event would be in Costa Rica. I'd fly everyone there for the weekend <laughs> beforehand. So. Um, uh, man, uh, custom printed T-shirts on demand. Oh, just like yeah, right. they just come right off the printer. Yeah, basically, yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> um, uh, a virtual, uh, no, uh, actually, one like, more. Uh, oh, one more. Oh, yeah, you're at nine. Oh gosh, uh, what what I would have won. What would I want to have? Oh, they would let us actually bring effing food into the place that we didn't have to pay for from them. <laughs> there you go. So we can bring food in and not have to get charged. Oh, my God. Um. Yeah. Uh, Tom, or Tom, uh, Ryan says LARPing. We actually almost had that tw- two years in a row. I have a contact who runs a LARPing group, and we've, we've gotten really close to having them show up and do, like, a small event where they try to, like, you know, recruit more members, and it's just not worked out yet. So Sure. Anyway, so with that funness out of the way, <laughs> uh, it's time to move into used books. And this is the point where we asked our guest to talk about a, a, a role-playing game campaign that they either played in in the past or ran in the past. And the idea is here to try to figure out some things we learned from that maybe we took into other games or lessons learned, things that were like, okay, that didn't work. Let's avoid those. So, Craig, what is a campaign you can talk about? So the system uh, whether you're a player or the DM, kind of an overview of the campaign, and if there's any specific points that you're like, you know, this is a lesson learned. Sure. Um, uh, not too long ago, I ran, I, I ran a, like a full, t- you know, beginning to end uh, campaign of Capers, of the game I designed. Hmm. Um, uh, for four people, we streamed it, and I recorded it. Um, the episodes are all on the Nerdburger Games YouTube channel. Um, but because it was on a weeknight, um, and we had people in different time zones and we had to kind of make time work for every, for everybody, it was two hour sessions. So like, you know, it wasn't like you go to a convention or a lot of home games are three, four and five hour sessions, things like that. So we were doing two hour sessions. So I found myself adapting when I was running that campaign to just try to figure out like how, what makes a good two hour session. If you, if you can only run a short game like that, what makes it work? Um, and so, uh, you know, like some of the things I, I discovered, like, I guess these are the lessons that came out of it were um, obviously get moving quickly. Like it's, it's a little tougher to have, you know, like normal games, you get together with everybody and you're hanging around and you kind of shoot the shit for a little while and you chit chat and it might be at, you know, 15, 20, half an hour before you get into the game. When, when you're restricted to two hours, you kind of got to get right in. Right. Um, and, uh, and get things moving. Um, one of the things I did to try to keep myself from babbling at the beginning and getting uh, and and also encouraging engagement from the players from session to session um, was to have players do the recap. Like mm-hmm. when we did a little recap of what happened in the last session, I would kind of set things up and then I would pass it to the players. And one person would talk about like, this is the thing that happened and this is the thing that happened. And we'd kind of get through it really quickly um to remind ourselves what happened and also in the case of this because it was being streamed and, and for consumption to uh to bring people up to speed who maybe had missed something or mm-hmm. um when you only have two hours um and and this is more important the more players you have um is making sure that you find a way to have like a great moment for each character like kind of have that in mind like i'm gonna i'm gonna have this kind of in my hip pocket so that each player each character has like their their cool their cool factor moment the Mm -hmm. moment that they get to really rock you want the group to kind of have some great moments in general and you want them to you want players and their characters to have their moments like in any campaign but um in any game but when you've got a three four hour game five hour game you know there's the potential you can wait to get to somebody like you're like, I know there's this really great moment coming for your character. It's going to be at the end. But if you only got two hours, I, you know, I'd never wanted to, to finish a two hours and felt like finish a two hour game and felt like one person was just kind of along for the ride mm-hmm. for that two hours. Um, 
So that also helps to keep the players excited and want to come back for the next one because they know that they're always going to get a little something. Um, and then, uh, you know, something that I think people use plenty in ongoing campaigns, um, but uh, it, it was really, really handy with the short two hour campaign because, because it made sure that there was always like a level of excitement there was to don't just kind of end it we're like okay well it's our two hours and now we'll just wrap and we'll pick up next week um but find a way to tease something find a way to end on a cliffhanger find some excite you know some sort of exciting moment that you can lead into right away which again helps with getting moving quickly mm -hmm. like if if the if model t is going over the cliff <laughs> at the end right. of this episode well the first thing we got to deal with next week is that model t is going over the cliff and we jump right in you know like kind of in media res and and have some action um and deal with that problem so these were just like you know looking back at that campaign these were things that i was like kind of consciously trying to make sure that i was doing um in order to keep a two-hour game session tight and moving and engaging for the players so when you you know, sat down to organize this and you started assembling your players and kind of figuring out how things went. Did you know this was going to be a five, six, seven session campaign or was it intended to go, you know, in forever and then it just didn't? Or like, was that also a constraint you had is that you had so many sessions and each session was going to be roughly two hours? Uh, well, the plan was to start with starting level characters and to take them to the extent of the game system. Um, and so like in capers, there's effectively five levels. Mm. And so um, it, it turned out that we leveled up every five sessions. Like we basically spent five sessions at level one, five sessions at level two, so forth. That wasn't planned. It just kind of worked out nicely that way. As okay. you know, and as I got toward the end, it looked like, oh, I've got like, you know, it's going to be five sessions and this will be a good break point to have everybody gain a new power or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so it ended up being 25 sessions that way. I was planning for it to be, you know, 20 plus sessions, however many it took to kind of tell a complete story and get the characters to be as powerful as the game allows. Gotcha. Because for me, um, like I, I've, I've gotten to the point where I'm actually sort of enjoying shorter sessions. Um, for example, Gen Con Online was this past week. Uh, I'm very, very sad to have missed Gen Con. I, I wouldn't have gone even if they put it on this year, but I'm still sad to have missed it. But I just like when he, when I get the the event schedule, I, I I do the Excel spreadsheet one, and then I I filter it in a lot of different ways to because there's just so many events, it's just overwhelming. <laughs> so for example, I don't like to play Pathfinder. I'm sure that there are some amazing Pathfinder games. There's probably some amazing Pathfinder DMs that if I ever played with them, I would change my life like religion. It's never going to happen because one of the first things I do is remove Pathfinder completely from the list. Do the same thing with Shadowrun because I don't care about Shadowrun either. And both of those two make up a huge amount of the, the event list. Uh, I remove anything like, you know, there's like seminars and panels and whatever, whatever. Basically, I do. I use negative filters to get rid of all the stuff I know I don't care about. Uh, I hmm. also remove anything that starts before 9 a.m. because I know I'm not <laughs> going to be there. And let's be honest, I'm not going to get there before 10 unless I'm running the game. So usually like on the first day on Thursday, I'll do 9 o'clock events. But after that, it's 10 o'clock. But one of the other things I do is I remove any event that's less than two hours long uh, if it's a game. Because when I first went to Gen Con, I tried that a few times. I tried to get into RPG sessions, and the two-hour sessions were just not fun. I, I never played in a two-hour session that I walked away from going, man, that was really cool. I think it's different if it's a campaign, and I'm only getting two hours, but I know there's going to be more to the story. So I'm kind of interested in the, the aspects of, yes, you only had two hours, but you really had, you know, 50 hours you just had to divide it into two hour sections so it kind of feels to me like it would be like those old serials that like indiana jones was based on where the first five minutes is always recapping what happened the last thing that happens is always this huge cliff cliffhanger that you're then going to start back on the on the other side so do you feel like it's like if you were doing the two hour session only how would that be different than this two hours but it's a continuing campaign um well with if you're going to do like a two hour one shot basically um mm -hmm. is what you're saying so like if you're doing a two hour one shot it 
it requires a number of things. Um, it requires the right game. There are some games that just don't work well for two R one shots. If if you're going to play a game that's going to have a bunch of combat in it and combat is slow, not good. Not a good game for two hours. Mm -hmm. um, you know, pick a game that's got something fast and loose. Do do uh, you know Savage Worlds? Quick combat, really boom boom boom. You can you can do a two hour game in Savage Worlds, tell a whole story, and have two fast combats in those two hours. Um, or pick a, a game that's kind of designed for short play. Um, you know, a fiasco game fits nicely in two hours with people. If the people know the system and kind of keep it, keep it moving, you can do a fat fiasco game in two hours. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, uh, you know, there's, um, like any, any, any game that's kind of humor based, um, <laughs> can often fit well into two hours, like a paranoia game. I, I would think works well in two hours because you're just going to spend two hours being just like ridiculous. Um, and, uh, so I think, I think that's, you know, at least some advice for as far as like a two hour one shot versus a campaign kind of situation is mm -hmm. you got to kind of find the right thing and keep the number of players small and have pre-gen characters. Yeah. Don't, don't make, don't ask people to generate a character for a half an hour and only get 90 minutes of play. Oh, if you've yeah. got a four hour game and you're going to take a bunch of like masks, players, masks, uh, you know, the, the PBTA game, the super, the super teen super game if you've got people that know the game or even that they don't you got a gm that really knows how to handle things you can take a four-hour mass game spend 30 or 40 minutes crunching characters and then still get a three plus hour game yeah but you can't do that in two hours no um the the one time that it, that it was borderline fun and it still wasn't great but it was probably the best experience i had at gen con in a two-hour game was um savage worlds and it was um there's there's a group of them and I apologize I can't remember their name but basically they run like Saturday morning cartoon themed games it's like that's like either that's all they do or this this day that was everything so like I was in like a Johnny Quest game and there were other people that played like a Thunder of the Barbarian game and there were other people that did like a you know again that sort of range of games and what I realized when Savage Worlds does go very fast you had pre gens so that definitely sped things up. But basically, everybody got one moment. And, you know, I think they did intentionally made sure everybody had their moment, but you really only got one. And, again, I don't know if it was intentional or not, but I feel like my moment came pretty early. And so then there was a long stretch where it was other people's moments. And I don't mind that too much. I, like, I want other people to have fun. Uh, but it, I was like, you know, I'm always analyzing when I'm in the game. I'm always analyzing, like, how is this GM doing? How would I do it differently? What do I want to steal from them? What do I want to use? And it felt like I had my moment. And so their attention was just, okay, this person hasn't had their moment yet. And it was almost, almost too much of that. You know, if it, you know, it's like you're, you're trying to pull something out of someone else who maybe isn't as interested or not. Sure. I'm getting way off topic here, but I no, think that's Savage, okay. I think Savage Worlds is a good system for a shorter game. Uh, my favorite at conventions is to run a four hour game, but I do like a 20 minute to 30 minute intro at the beginning, get our pre gens, introduce each other, set table rules. We take a break halfway through for like 15 minutes, and then I like to wrap up at least 15 minutes early so that people, again, if you're in Gen Con, they got to get all these, all these other places. So really, it's a three hour game, but it's got breaks built in. And I think right. that's a really good length for a convention game. And there's two there's two two things that came up as part of what you were describing. One thing that I thought of was you were talking about these games that are based on these properties, like a Thunder the Barbarian game or whatever. I played in a, a game. Um, there, there was a guy who every year did a different – he did League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, but he picked different decades. He picked, like, literary characters from different decades. Mm -hmm. um, and, like, there were movie characters and things like that. So in those types of games – like, you know what you're getting. Like, there's there's a hook. Like, you're going to go in and be like, oh, I'm in the world of Thunder the Barbarian. The GM doesn't need to explain a bunch of stuff to you because yeah. probably the people showing up for that game love Thundar. Um, and then um, also, uh, what was the other one? Uh, crap, now I lost my train of thought. What was the other thing? Oh, when, if, if you're going to sign up for a two-hour game, it takes the right, it kind of, you know, it's the right player should sign up for a two-hour game. Somebody who knows that, like, okay, I'm not going to necessarily get three, four big moments for my character. I'm going to get one or two, but I'm going to enjoy other people having their moment and just enjoy the show. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to watch the show and have the entertainment. Um, 
and uh and another thing that makes two hour games um really um uh, appealing in a convention setting is if you really go nuts on the two hour games you can play a lot of different <laughs> games you can try so much stuff and that was what i usually would use gen con for before i started having to deal with being a, a publisher was was i would go to gen con just to try stuff i'd never played and I would just, I do, I would do some four hour games, but I do a lot of two hours because mm-hmm. it would allow me to try so many games. Yeah. I just, maybe I just had a run of bad luck early on, but I played in several two hour games and just, I never got a satisfying uh, game from them mm-hmm. or fully satisfying. So I've kind of eliminated that, but I well, do still focus on games that like, I, again, I've said it many, many times, d d is still one of my, if not my favorite game. I love fifth edition. I do not play d d 5e at any convention that I go to unless I'm running it for people. Because I can do that any time and anywhere. I want to play the game I've never heard of before, or this, you know, or with the designer if that's a thing. So I very much focus on indie games or just games that, you know, I don't know about yet is is my kind of goal when I go in there. Uh, so Kraken Killer jumped into chat a little while ago. He's also uh, hangs out on Discord. He's also playing in Fantasy Age with me this week. Uh, but definitely, yes. Uh, Thunder of the Barbarian. This is for Remy. Thunder of the Barbarian. You need to track that down on YouTube or some other place. It's it's definitely worth watching. It is it is perfectly made for a role playing game session. Pirates of Dark Water. I would put in there as well. I would love it if somebody would run either of those two games for me. I don't want to run them. I want to experience them. <laughs> uh, and it looks like uh, Kraken Killer also asked, "What are some?" games to try so you got to try a whole bunch of games at gen con you've you know played a bunch of different ones uh any that you would throw out as winners maybe that other people (laughs) still may not have heard of um i really enjoyed the strange i got a chance to play that at gen con a few years ago like i said the last few years gen con has been you know being a designer and publisher um i I played time watch before it kick-started um that was a really fun i think uh, I th- think those might have both been two hour games. Um, but uh, Time Watch is great. It, uh, that's by Pelgrane Press, designed by Kevin Culp. Um, it's Time Cops. You know, it's like, you know, something goes wacky with history and your Time Cops have to go and set things right. Um, and it has a mechanic built in there so that you can bill and Ted things, um, which is if you run up against a problem, you can solve the problem later. Mm-hmm. Um, and the solution will be there for you. You just have to remember to go time travel later and set that up. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a fun little game. Uh, uh, if you're if you're going to the conventions, um, you know, like with set with with generic systems, I wholeheartedly recommend looking for games that where they're doing heavily themed things like that, where it's like it's their version of Thundar or, um, you know, like uh, some some. You know, like c- cartoon properties are great like you know nostalgic kind of stuff because the people that are going to show up for those games are the people that are really into it so you're going to be at a table full of people that are like not only are probably dig that game system um because people or well at the very least they dig the um you know the property that right. the, the game system is being used to emulate yeah the strange is the strange is wacky and weird that's fun your character changes based on what world you're in <laughs> I uh, I've not played the strange. I, that, that's the cipher system. Numenera. Yeah, it's one of the early yeah. cipher cipher games. So I did get to play in Time Watch. I think I did that last the last Gen Con that I got to go to. Again, I'm Time Cop the movie. Actually, I'm a big fan of that and the idea of time, cop, t- yeah. time Heist and Bill and Ted. Yeah, the, all that was great. Uh, so I definitely really enjoyed that. Um, I have not played in the strange. I played in a game and I, again, it's kill me. I can't think of the name. But it was basically a Sherlock Holmes uh rpg where sherlock holmes has gone missing and you and your fellow adventurers uh take up the their his place so that the, the uh, they don't realize he's missing or something so basically it's a you're playing sherlock holmes but you don't have to worry about him solving everything he's not there uh mm-hmm. so you're you're you know handling things and you know, all the different classes that was that was quite a lot of fun too many players though that's another thing that drives me nuts at gen con games is they have like eight players at a table and I get when you're getting credit for running games and the, the player hours that you accumulate are, are good for you, but eight players at a table is just, just too many, in my opinion. So, Yeah, that's rough. And here comes the train, everybody. Sorry. That's right. <laughs> uh, I'm just checking on chat. Um, yeah, okay. 
Uh, so anything else? Oh, oh, oh! I played a Savage Worlds Miami Vice game. A few oh, years that ago. sounds it was cool. Spectacular! I was Sonny Crockett, <laughs> and they had Matchbox cars of the actual cars okay. that the characters drove, and everybody went home with a CD of early '80s music. <laughs> now that they burned out for you. That is that is cool. <laughs> I got to listen play... to it on the drive home. It was great. I think it was. Uh, I think it might have been Origins, uh, but I got to play in a Transformers game. I know Ryan, he's in chat, Teleporta. He's a huge Transformer fan. He actually runs a 5e hack of uh, Transformers. He's done, I, I think I played in it. We did it at a Catacon a couple of years, but this was just a GM I found. But yeah, and they even brought like the toys that you could like look at. Um, it was a lot of fun. And again, the Transformers is a property I love. So that, that was another, you know, my childhood. G.I. Joe, Transformers, Thunder, Pirates, Dark Water. I'm sure there's a couple others in there, but just uh, super friends, of course. But, you know, those are things I grew up on that mean a, big, mean a lot to me. I even I played in a game once. It was a Smurfs ripoff, but you don't know it till very late. Uh, you Basically, the village is being attacked by blue demons, uh, which is what Gargamel <laughs> thinks the Smurfs are. Uh, but, yeah, that was actually quite a lot of fun. Oh, and if you're, if you're a Transformers fan, um, take a look for uh, Commandroids which was on Kickstarter a little while back. Um, I'm not sure where it stands as far as getting published off the top of my head, but it's basically Transformers with the serial numbers scratched off. Oh, nice. Uh, so the Kraken Cooler, yeah. So actually my max now is five. Like I, I actually prefer three or four in my games, anything more than that. And I think it starts to suffer. Five is the absolute max that I would run uh, in a game. I prefer four. That's my ideal group size unless i'm playing die laughing in which case there needs to be six or seven at the table but that's because you're going to be murdering everybody <laughs> that's uh, the point of the game so cyclops <laughs> havoc vulcan jumped in chat that's the first time i've seen that name so thank you wow. for, for hanging out <laughs> um and they said they saw someone playing a role-playing game based on the transformers uh looks like using the old tsr Mar marvel role-playing game sure that could work i actually <laughs> i ran that just a couple days ago i ran i ran that for some people mm -hmm. and i had a lot of fun but there's definitely better systems than uh, than that for basically anything. All right, so let's move on to what is it? actually everyone's really favorite part of the show. <laughs> and this is when we truly make asses of ourselves in the Where Have My Fingers Been game. Do you remember oh, this I one, Craig? I, I don't. Once you start talking about it, I'll probably it'll, okay. it'll jump back into my head. So the idea here is, again, we're going to prompt each other, and we're going to create a scene with our fingers where we're going to talk back and forth based on the scene that is set. If you want to get really creative, you can always bring in a third person because Scott always likes to do that because Scott's actually good at this. Uh, and the idea is to have a scene beginning, middle and end with this prompt of where have your fingers been? But what's most important is you have to, uh, I'm sorry, New York Tater just chimed in that he's been listening, but now he's watching because this is his favorite part. Um, oh, you have to sing the song before you start. And it's, where have my fingers been? I said, where have my fingers been? So, Craig, you are the guest. Again, do you want to prompt me first or do you want to go first? Um, I'm going to have you prompt me because I got to remember how this works. Okay. Uh, so, Craig, first of all, sing the song. Where have my fingers been? I said, where have my fingers been? <laughs> Your fingers have been, oh, man, there's so many places. Um, okay, so your fingers have been outside of the Cartoon Network Savage Worlds room at Gen Con, and you're trying to find a seat in an open game. The Cartoon Network? Well, like, you know, like I was saying, it's like the group that runs all these cartoon... Uh, okay, because I don't, I don't watch anything on the Cartoon Network. Then this will be um, great. Okay, but I'll, I, I can go with cartoons. Right? Yes, just okay. cartoons, yes. But it's the Savage Worlds cartoon. It doesn't have to be. Okay, well, I'm going to go with Savage Worlds because that's the one that, you know, you can turn that into anything. So these two guys are supposed to talk to each other? Yep, and one of them could be like running the room, you can be friends, but you're basically, you're trying to get into a game. <laughs> Hi, is uh, is this the Rick and Morty game? <laughs> doesn't matter. Life is meaningless, and we're all gonna die. So that yes. doesn't really inspire a lot of uh, confidence in this game. <laughs> Games are meaningless. It doesn't make a difference what you roll in your die. 
eventually you're going to die and there's another one of you in a different universe. Cool, can I meet that one? No, he's an asshole. How do you know that? Because I met him, he's an asshole. I'm leaving, this game sucks. In another universe, you stayed for the game. Crap! <laughs> and then he plays. And that's where your fingers have been. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> All right, fantastic. So now it's my turn to make an ass of myself. <laughs> where have my fingers been? I said, where have my fingers been? Um, your fingers have been to the world's largest um, role-playing game store. It is a store specifically for role-playing games. Um, and one of your fingers is looking for a title that is out of print. And the other one is the store uh, worker, the person who works there and, and knows the entire inventory. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I uh, I called earlier. I'm looking for that uh, rare third printing of the second edition of the Fiend Folio, but it's the one that was actually misprinted and page 68 is upside down and it's also in Italian, but it reversed. You have to look at it in the mirror. <laughs> what, you were serious? Like... I thought, I thought that was a joke. No, no, I, I'm completely serious. I uh, I called and you 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 said you thought you had it. I mean, I drove like seven hours to get here, so I I really appreciate it if you would uh, you know if you'd look for it. Oh, of, of course. Nope. <laughs> I checked everywhere. You son of a bitch! And that's where my fingers have been. Jeez. <laughs> Fantastic. So, with that out of the way, uh, it's time to move into the last segment of the official show. We always do a QA and a at the end for anyone who's hanging out in chat. If you have any questions you'd like to ask myself or Craig, they don't have to be role-playing game related, but that certainly helps. But before we get there, we like to do cryptozoology. And this is where we're going to talk about a monster, primarily from D&D, but again, it doesn't have to be. We're going to talk about maybe ways we've used it in the past, some of our favorite ways to use it, and then maybe brainstorm, brainstorm, Talking, words, fun. Some ways that we could use these creatures in the future for games. So, Craig, again, you are my guest. So what monster did you bring for us to talk about tonight? Uh, we're going to talk about doppelgangers. Oh, I um, love doppelgangers. So, Craig, why don't you tell us about... Oh, I mean, um, Michael, why don't you tell us about uh, what you love about doppelgangers? There they are. Yes. <laughs> so we'll start. So uh, this is the fifth edition Monsters Manual. Uh, doppelgangers are on page 82. So just some quick things about this version. Uh, they are a challenge rating of three. They have three abilities, shape changer, ambushes, and surprise attacks. Uh, they also have some actions, multi-attack, slam, and read thoughts, which is pretty important because they can read surface thoughts and that's how they get into character and know what you're thinking. Uh, it gives some background on the doppelgangers and kind of like what they do. And generally speaking, they like to infiltrate and, uh, you know, take over the role, like say a, a magistrate or a governor or a king or queen or prince and live as, in luxury as long as they can. Other members of their family might take on other roles around them to help sell the ruse until they get caught and have to run away. Uh, it does mention changelings in here because I know in Eberron changelings are an actual uh, race that you can play and um, it says that here the doppelgangers are too lazy to raise their own kids so they will <laughs> usually assume an attractive uh, male figure impreg seduce and impregnate a female and leave them to raise their kids who will look like a normal member of that race until they hit a, uh, like uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for puberty and then they're true form will be revealed and they probably will go off and try to join their kind. So just in case you were, you know, confused about what doppelgangers are, they're basically shapeshifters, humanoids. They can take on the appearance of anyone and they are great for making your potty, your potty, your party paranoid. Uh, I am a huge, huge fan of doppelgangers. Some of the best games I've ever ran, my opinion, may not be my player's opinion, involves doppelgangers uh i've said this many times before but the movie the thing is one of my all-time favorite movies and it has inspired many and much of the way that i run games and so th i think that's where that came from originally Even before it was doppelgangers it was just the idea of you have this party of people and they can't trust that other people are who they say they are and and when I'm playing a game with doppelgangers, that's what I want. As I want everybody, um, you know, I, can, I see your background behind you as the knives out. 
uh, logo. <laughs> That's what I want in that party. Is I want knives out, no one trusting anyone. <laughs> so what about you, Craig? You brought them to the table. What is it about you like about doppelgangers? Um, well, I think, like, here, here's the thing. I don't think, and it's, I've been playing games for a long time, but I don't think I've ever used a doppelganger in a game. Um, and I, when you, you asked about what I wanted to do, I was like, well, well I'm going to stick with something that like, I either, I either haven't, or it's just been so long that I don't recall the specifics or it was a minor thing. Like I just, you know, used one in one encounter or something. Um, because I thought it would be fun to explore like what you can do with them. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, of course, like you were talking about is you can make the players paranoid. You can find a way to have, uh, you know, with, with one of the players, um, involvement, you know, you could replace one of the characters for a time um, and have that uh, that that doppelganger, um, uh, you know, masquerading as the player's character with the with the player's involvement. And like, you're like, just, you know, tell them, you, you trust me, you'll get your character back. But right now we're going to have this doppelganger infiltrate the group. Um, and so let's see how long, you know, you can keep it secret. Yeah. Um, um, and then just and give them prompts that like every so often there's certain things they have to try to like accidentally give away, like see if they get caught. Um, so, you know, that that's an easy thing to do. There's there's, of course, you know, impersonating and NPCs that are important to the characters, um, particularly uh, probably I would think very, uh, very useful, like after the characters have spent a long time getting to know um, a particular NPC in a town like if it's this is the town that they go back to all the time or where they're where they're from or whatever and then they find that their friend has been replaced or was maybe a doppelganger all along mm -hmm. um so uh what, what and i've got some other ideas here you know other things here too but what have you what have you used doppelgangers for uh, it, mostly that i've used them in the past was the very basic somebody gets captured they take over try to sow paranoia in the party Though I really don't, I don't play that way much anymore. Like I, I don't know that at this point in time in my career as a GM that I would want to do that. Uh, so I'm thinking more about the ways that I, I could use them. And the first thing that came to mind um, is I think it's the movie Dave. And that, isn't that where they find a doppelganger? Not truly a doppelganger, but a, a, a lookalike of the president. Sure. Um, and replace there's Dave and there's and Moon over Parador both are yeah replacing somebody with a lookalike yeah so maybe that's something where the the players know someone who's in a position of authority maybe a king a prince a, a wizard of some sort of some renown and they have to do a certain thing or it's going to cause like a war or some kind of big you know big bad thing happens they're not around or they're incapacitated so you know rather than maybe having the bard step in and try to disguise herself they find a doppelganger it's like, hey, <laughs> could you please pretend to be this guy or this lady? Install them as a puppet prince. Yeah, just for like a week. Keep, to keep the kingdom from falling apart right. till, till a transition can happen. Exactly. And then how does that go? Do they say yes? Do they say no? Do they decide that they want to stay and then turn around and say, these people are trying to install a doppelganger in my place because <laughs> I'm the true king. <laughs> like, I could see that being a ton of fun. Uh, yeah, you could ramp that up. Like the, the the characters go and find this doppelganger, convince them to you know take over the role of the monarch, and then that doppelganger has a rival who comes in and replaces some magistrate or um, you know sheriff or seneschal or you know somebody else in a position of authority, <laughs> and now starts actively plotting against the characters um, with the intention of replacing the replacement and setting up their own current person's death the magistrate or whoever you know like yeah. it, it could get really kind of eluded like just keep adding top it, it's like seven degrees of kevin bacon when everyone's kevin bacon yeah uh I, <laughs> honestly, being, being john malkovich yeah uh, the <laughs> other thing malkovich. i thought of uh, in the lore how they you know they will in, impregnate uh members not of their race and have them raise their children so you know you take that to the, the sort of an nth degree the players are traveling through a, a town or a village and like 12, 15 different women were all seduced by this one, you know, debonair doppelganger all around the same time. So within like a week period, you know, all of these women who maybe are married to other people. So, <laughs> so the fact that they had an affair is coming to light, but they're also their children. So maybe the players decide to like take these children to try to help them find their real dad. 
Uh, you know, so that's like a whole thing. It's like it's a goodwill mission to take these children who are lost and confused and they don't know why they don't belong here. They don't they're not wanted now. They're they're not their real dads. Kick them out of the house. And they're like, OK, I'll we'll help you. We'll help you find the doppelganger. <laughs> um, hit on the idea of uh, having um, a series like if you can, if you can, it would take a little work on the GM's part and it, it might stretch the bounds a little bit and some players may not take to it too well. But if you could find a way to have, uh, you know, if you have villains that can regularly escape, you know, like you, you don't get to defeat the bad, the big bad guy until after, you know, you, you, you face them a few times. You don't, they don't just, the, the, the characters don't just, you know, get rid of them. Like the first time they run into them. Um, what, what happens if every um, major villain that the characters run into is the same doppelganger? Mm -hmm. um and they think they're dealing with like five different villains that are doing five different things and it's actually this doppelganger who's masterminding these five different factions and just appearing as each of these different things right basically they're they're running let's say like you know the thieves guild but they're also running the merchants guild they're also running like the night watch or the you know so they're basically in positions of power of all these different organizations and they're playing them all perfectly so that they you know, don't get in each other's way too much, but they, they get in, you know, they get enough done that they look like they're actually succeeding on their missions and they're just like laughing at everybody. And then one day they just decide to leave. Or <laughs> let's say the PCs get involved, they find out they killed them. And now you have this, you know, providence this somewhere. Power vacuum. Power, like exactly. Like the most powerful position in like five different factions all disappears at the same time. You're going to have anarchy, <laughs> which would be great. <laughs> And and what happens when people start realizing that you never see the you know you know, you know I've never seen the head of the merchants guild and the head of the thieves guild at the same time yeah. like I've never <laughs> that's weird and what happens if that doppelganger who's doing all that masterminding has one back pocket doppelganger friend who can appear as <sighs> one of those others so it's like the Batman so thing often when someone thinks they figured out who Batman is sense. they they yeah. show up as Bruce Wayne they have someone else in the bat cowl so they'd be like well, look it's <laughs> Batman and Bruce Wayne so yeah. it can't be me. yeah uh, <laughs> so I, I was oh I want to mention the, one of the games I ran uh, that Brad was in I don't don't think Ryan was in this game I think it was before Ryan, uh, it was set in Eberron, and there was this NPC who met the characters right before they got into the Sharn, uh, which is like one of the big cities in, in mm-hmm. Eberron, and they were mostly supposed to be like a throwaway uh, NPC. But one of the things that I love to do when I run NPCs is I like to just throw out random details that that sound like they're important but they're meaningless, and then I see which ones the players latch onto, and then I make them meaningful. And I describe this NPC as having just very vibrant green eyes. Not glowing green eyes, but like just close to that. And it meant nothing. But they, they kept circling back to, you know, that person had really vibrant green eyes. So then I started sprinkling in other NPCs that also had vibrant green eyes. And the backstory I created is it was the same doppelganger, and that was like their calling card. Whenever they <laughs> took a role, they just gave themselves these really vibrant green eyes and so they started realizing wait you know maybe there's this group or organization and i don't think that ever got to like a conclusion but i loved that that's where it was going when it was just a thrown away descriptor that i threw into an npc description excellent and because because the players latched onto something that's one of my favorite things is when the players decide that something's important and then you're like no that was totally not important but now i'm gonna make it important um exactly uh, New York Tater has to take off. Thank you, sir, for dropping in. And then just quickly, Cyclops Havoc Vulcan has been talking about playing Marvel Face Rip. Uh, like I said, I ran it just a couple of days ago. I do. It's not a great game, but I love running it. It's it's really, really fun. I enjoy it quite a lot. Um, so I'm actually looking to run a, 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 a... The last one I ran was to see if I could run a semi-serious game, because usually when I run Marvel, it's just like the most fat, crap, crazy, <laughs> silly game. But this one was, you know... Is, is not overly dramatic or melodramatic, but it was like a serious game. Uh, so, but we all created our own characters and we used character generation and they were wildly disparate powers. So now I want to try to run it with actual characters. So like I have a Spider-Man, a Daredevil, and see if I can run that, make it make sense. So anyway, so if you're interested, Cyclops have Gulkin, uh, 
talk to me later. I'll give you an invite to our Discord. We have a channel we used to set up one shots, and that's how I set up that. So it'll happen sometime in the future. My apologies, Craig. Please continue. That's okay. Um, and then there was one other thing that struck me. Well, there's real quickly. There's a band of doppelgangers running around impersonating the character, the, the PCs, mm. ruining their reputation. Classic. Yes. Um, that's classic. But then I thought, here's one. Have a campaign that, let's say you got a camp, just using round numbers, you got a campaign that's going to run 20 sessions. Spend the first five sessions never dealing, other than just like occasional NPC interactions, never really dealing with humanoids. Um, you're, you know, you're, you're, the characters are out in the forest clearing out the, the monsters. They're, you know, they're doing, they're dealing with undead, right? They're just whatever, not no humanoids. But you introduce some NPC humanoids, you know, like some just people in the town that they, NPCs that they run into. At, at session five or six, you start, revealing that um you know th through whatever means that this this npc that they've gotten to know is a doppelganger that they're impersonating someone and then this other person is a doppelganger who's impersonating someone and as you go along for the next several sessions it's just constant revelation that everybody except them is a doppelganger and they're all impersonating these people in this town um if you want to see paranoia in the group with a bunch of players who are going to be sure that somebody is in on it. <laughs> that mm -hmm. One of you, one of you is in on this. Or maybe all of them. Maybe you're the only real person here. Or maybe, 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 <laughs> yeah, you've talked to all but one of the players and said, okay, secretly, you're a doppelganger. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then, you know, at about the five, you know, at about the, you know, the 15 or 16 session point, then you start to reveal whatever the master plan is, what the, whatever the plot is, whatever, whatever's, you know, why that is the way it is. Cause it's basically, it, it, it strikes me as like, this is the fantasy version of, are we living in a, in a, um, you know, are we living in the matrix? Is this a, is this a virtual reality you know, are these people real? Am I the only real person here? Are they AIs? Are they sentient? Are they, uh, you know, hyper-realistic androids? Um, you, you just, you could, you could go to any science fiction movie that has those kinds of things and just twist them into the fantasy version of that. Right. Um, it's just they're doppelgangers rather than, you know, replicants dig or digital, digital project, right. uh, digital projections. Uh, <laughs> so I had one more come to mind, uh, and then we can wrap up unless you have something else. Um, but I just had this idea. There's like this. Um, elderly matriarch patriarch that uh, thought they lost their child you know in a war lost at sea some sort of adventuring situation and this doppelganger much like a con man has shown up and claimed to be this thought to be dead heir and the players get involved but this person this elderly person they want to believe and you know is it is it better to out this doppelganger, perhaps kill them, or at least reveal this masquerade, or just let this old person who's got maybe a year left tops anyways, live that year thinking that they family is still alive? They yeah. were reunited, yeah. Yeah, like, I mean, again, I'm, I'm smiling, but that's actually kind of sad, but, you know, it's the, uh, is it better to live in ignorance? And maybe they even kind of know, but they just won't admit to it because they would rather believe this falsehood well there, there there's a thing that happens and i hope i'm not getting this wrong we talked about it on my podcast i think it happens in japan because all the wild stuff happens in japan but like you like it, it or it may have been on some other country that has a, a cultural thing that kind of happens similarly but basically like for a uh, an elderly person who is very very ill and it's very clearly going to die very soon you can hire, like like that elder, elderly person, say, has a grandchild who is pregnant, but who will not have the baby before the elderly person is going to die. You can hire a baby, basically. You can, a mother will, will allow you to pretend their baby is this new baby so that the elderly person can hold their great-grandchild in their arms one time. And, and in some cases, the elderly person knows this. It's just mm. a cathartic thing. It's like, I'm not going to be here for that moment, but you know, I, uh, you know, this, this will be a stand-in. This will be a way for me to, to connect in some way, just in, emotionally, and have a, a, a catharsis about the fact that I'm not going to be here for the end. 
and, and you know i'm not i'm not going to be here for the birth right um th those sorts of things yeah it's human beings will do some really strange things to uh it, and i don't want to say maybe not strange but just some out of you know, things that you wouldn't expect some out of the ordinary things some very inventive things to uh to deal with uh um, emotion and um, inevitability of certain things like death and yeah. Not not to bring the show. <laughs> well, I, well, <laughs> I, mean, I, I I think it's I, personally I think it's it's like it's it's kind of beautiful. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, and I and again, I'd already put us on that path, so I don't think you took yeah. us anywhere. We already were all right. Go. Uh, so Cyclops <laughs> Havoc Vulcan asked, "What is the Richard Gere early '90s movie with Jodie Foster?" I don't know the movie, so I don't know how it relates. Do you know a early '90s Richard Gere, Jodie Foster movie? Is that Nell? Is Richard Gere in Nell? I don't. Taxi Driver. Summersby. Taxi Driver isn't Richard Gere. That's uh... no. That's <laughs> no. Summersby has the two of them. No, Nell is like William Hurt or something like that. Uh. Summersby. I'm not even sure what that's about. I've heard of the movie. I just don't even. I don't even know what it's about. Yeah. A farmer returns home from the Civil War, but his wife begins to suspect the man is an imposter. Ah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> that would be a Summersby. Apparently, that's it. All right. So yep. we'll we'll close up all doppelgangers, or are we? Uh, and move on to the last <laughs> portion, which is our Q and A. So anybody who's in chat, we got a, a, quite a few people hanging out with us. Again, thank you all. And anyone who's watching and listening but not chatting, cool to have you here as well. If you, if now's the time to jump in. If you have any questions for me and or Craig, please let us know. There's a little bit of a de delay. So while we're waiting for chat to catch up, uh, Craig, one more time, let people know where they can find you, your stuff on the Internet, and then one more time about this convention you're running in a week and a half. Um, yeah, I'm at Nerdburger Craig on Twitter. There's uh, the website is nerdburgergames.com. You can go to drivethroughrpg.com for for the for all, all my game stuff as well. Just search for Nerdburger Games there. Um, the the convention is happening on the 14th, 15th, 16th of August. It's called Nerd Burger Con. Uh, we've got like 40 events, um, excuse me, game events and all sorts of other things that are going on. Um, uh, if you go to nerdburgergames.com, there's a, uh, a a page for the convention, which uh, you can download the the program, and there's a link to the Discord, and that's where you sign up for games. And um, we're we're like upwards of 65 to 70, 65 plus percent full on game seats, but so that there's still plenty. Um, there's only a handful of games that have filled up completely. Um, so there's at least like a seat or two left in a lot of games. So. Uh, a lot of interesting things that you have maybe never heard of. Maybe you'll get a chance to discover uh, something brand new or play something that you've always wanted to. All right. Go check it out. Very cool. Well, thank you for joining me tonight and being a, uh, my co-host. I really appreciate it. Sorry, uh, Ryan, sure. you weren't able to jump in as a third. The, the timing just wasn't going to work out, unfortunately, because I'm really slow at setting this up. And once I had got it organized for two people, I'm like, I need 20 minutes if I'm going to do this again to add in a third. <laughs> it's not going to work. Uh, so no questions have come in yet, but uh, while we're waiting just a little bit longer, again, my name is Michael. You can find everything I do at the RPG Academy website, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Don't ever post there because I'm just too old for that, apparently. Um, I also have a Smallville podcast that I've been doing. I, we're, we have two episodes left to record for the entirety of season one. Episode 13 just came out. I'm uh, still having a ton of fun doing this. I'm, I rewatched the entire 10 seasons of Smallville in like a month and a half. Uh, near the beginning of the quarantine when everything oh. kind of got shut down. I was looking for something <laughs> to watch. And I was like, you know, there's some really bad episodes, but there's some really good ones too. And I decided I want to talk about it. So I started a podcast. It's called Farm to Fable. And uh, you can find that at Smallville Farm to Fable or go to my Twitter. It's on there as well. But if you uh, have never watched Smallville and would like to, because now's the time, or if you watched it once before and you want to relive it, now's the time to do that as well. You can follow along as we discuss every single episode in all 10 seasons. At least that's the goal. But we're almost done with season one. Uh, and Thanks. then lastly, for me, the big thing, a Catacon 2020 Ready Player Characters is what we're calling our virtual arm of the convention since we can't have the real one. September 1st is our Kickstarter. So please uh, come buy a virtual ticket so you can play some games and then uh, maybe buy a t-shirt that you won't get for a year and a half or two years. Something like that. So, 
All right, so still no questions. We had quite a few people in chat, but I guess there's just we covered everything. There was there was nothing nothing left to ask. So we were that complete. Exactly. Or maybe they just worry we're doppelgangers and they don't want us to, you know, they don't want to spill any secrets or anything, possibly. So, uh, so I guess we'll just go ahead and wrap it up. So, Craig, thank you again. Everybody just give a, a wave out, say goodbye, and we'll see you when we see you. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye.